Andy Staples from On3. Andy, it is good to have you today, my friend. What's up, gentlemen? How are we doing? Good, man. How are you? What's up with it? I don't know if you just heard Silk, but did you have Graham Mertz winning a game on the road with his arm on your bingo card this week? I didn't, but I also didn't have South Carolina being the Swiss cheesiest defense they would play. But hey, what I thought was interesting is they recognized that. They recognized that their defense was not going to stop South Carolina's offense either, and they started taking shots. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the awareness. I, I like the, okay, we can break out of our typical mold of we're going to be very conservative and try to limit possessions because that is not how this particular game is going to get won. So I, I thought that was a really good sign because the flexibility part is the part I was wondering about with Billy Napier as a play caller. And you saw some flexibility there, which leads me to believe that in the future, when he hires someone to call the plays, perhaps schematic flexibility is more, more of an option than I thought it was going to be. Cause I was wondering, okay, what's going to happen here? Is he going to, is he going to try to find a clone of him or is it maybe going to be somebody, somebody else? But I, I thought that was just understanding that the circumstances of the game and then adapting to them, I thought was really good. Yeah. Now, Andy, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, so you're, you're obviously plugged into the Gators. You live in Gainesville, um, but you're always very tight, you know, obviously tied in nationally as well. What are the thoughts on the Gators, right? You know, they're not a lot of expectations going into this year, a lot of three and four, maybe five win projections for the Gators this year. They sit at five and two, have Georgia, have FSU who are ranked highly. You have probably three more toss up games in there, but, mm -hmm. but what is the talk on the street about Graham Mertz? Obviously, you saw Wisconsin score, what, nine points uh, yeah. this past weekend. They probably would have liked some of that Graham Mertz offense. But but what is the talk nationally? Are they are they starting to see that the Gators maybe are a little bit ahead of schedule or is it still too early to, to tell and too up and down for them? No, they're too up and down. I mean, Graham yeah. Mertz didn't play well against Iowa, and neither did Tanner Mordecai or Braden Locke. Like, mm -hmm. if, if Graham Mertz had played against Iowa on Saturday, he would have had a hard time because Iowa's defense is a lot better than South Carolina's defense. So that that's – Remember, it was the circuit like South Carolina's defense was terrible. So let's not go crazy, but it was fun to watch Florida throw the ball down the field a little bit and find some new weapons. Like I think the, the two tight ends were a, a big bright spot in that game and Boardingham and, and Hanson. So yeah, I, I do think they're they're figuring out how to use what they have. And so I think that's good. I think they're about where I thought they'd be because I said they'd win seven games this season. So mm -hmm. two more. And honestly, they might not win two more. <laughs> like mm -hmm. with the rest of the schedule, they might not. They might win one. It's or a possibility. They might yeah. So if they can win two more against this schedule, that's a good sign because look at how many young guys they're playing. So I, I think Arkansas is the most winnable of these games mm -hmm. and we'll see what like Arkansas is an interesting one this weekend because Arkansas has lost five in a row, but they've been competitive in all those games. I mean, they, they were in the game with Alabama until the very end. They really are due a win and they're playing Mississippi state. So they're probably going to get one this week. And then what happens then if they lose to Mississippi state, they may fire Sam Pittman. <laughs> I'm not like, I'm not exaggerating there. That's what I need. They yeah, come I mean, in with a fire <laughs> coach. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I need an O line coach too, Andy. So you know, what I'm saying you got two O line coaches. Yeah, I was gonna say you have two. Nah, I just need one. <laughs> you said I got two. I said I need one. Sam yeah. Pittman as as the one O line coach is uh, that's a significant upgrade for almost every team in the country. So yeah, if if he were on the market, that would be something. I'd, I I don't know what's gonna happen the rest of the way with them, but yeah, I mean, you look at LSU. Like, are do you really want to get in a shootout with LSU? Because you're gonna have to. Not at all. But I, that that's the one thing I'm I'm curious to see what they do because they we saw them do it against South Carolina. I think we'll see them do it more. Take some more risks. Like that's the mm -hmm. only way you're gonna have a chance against Georgia, against Florida State. Is you're gonna have to take some risks, throw some shots downfield. Florida's defense isn't good enough to just rely on them stopping a really good offense over and over. That's that's not gonna happen. So. They need to try to get some turn, try to create some turnovers, and offensively, they're going to have to take some chances against those good teams because 
Like LSU, they just get in shootouts. Like LSU's defense isn't good either. That that LSU Florida game could look a lot like South Carolina Florida. The difference is LSU's offense even better than South Carolina. You don't think they would try to go with like the Tennessee game plan of long extended drives, slow it down, try to limit LSU's offensive possessions? I know. I, I don't LSU's think that's a, better. I don't think that's a good idea. LSU's bad in the secondary. They're not bad up front. Mm. So you, you're you're not going to be able to have those long sustained drives, but you may be able to burn them. So you, again, it's the circumstances of the game, and that's Ole Miss got in a shootout with LSU. Missouri got in a shootout with LSU. It doesn't mean you're going to win them. Like Ole Miss won, Missouri didn't. Mm -hmm. But Florida can play in a shootout with LSU, I think. And who knows the ball, but like the ball bouncing is a thing. Think about the the play that where the ball bounces off of Pearsall's hands in the fourth quarter and it bounces into Eugene Wilson's hands. What if it bounces into a South Carolina player's hands? What kind of conversation are we having right now? Like a depressing one. Exactly. But what if what if you do that again and it's in a, it's a pass that bounces off an LSU player's hands and into a Florida defender's hand? Like that's that's good. You've got to die, you've got to make the recipe for each game based on the ingredients of the game. And so Missouri and LSU, you're probably going to have to play shootouts. That's mm -hmm. just – that's the way it's going to go. If you try to play the way that Nick just talked about, you're going to lose. Arkansas – That's not even a conversation we would have had before seeing them do it last week. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's great to know it's there. And yeah. I you know, I don't know if that if that's a function of South Carolina's defense. I mean, we'll, we'll see. When they play Georgia – if they try that stuff against Georgia and they just get completely shut down, then maybe it was South Carolina's defense. But I do think they found some more people they trust offensively mm -hmm. in terms of targets. Uh, Boardingham really, I, I feel like, opens things up. I think Georgia is a great example of this. Look at how Georgia uses their tight ends to open everything else up. Now, Bowers is hurt. Probably not yeah. seeing Bowers in the, in the cocktail party. But they've I got him, Oscar. I Del wish Messi. him a slow but healthy recovery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You wish him a recovery where he comes yeah. back for the SEC championship yeah. game. Don't want him to I, push I, it. I understand. So, but that—that's the thing. Oscar Delt probably becomes a bigger piece of the offense if Bowers isn't there. But they've—they've they've established that that's going to be how they open things up. That they, you know, they've got good receivers, but. They can do things with the tight end underneath. They can, mm -hmm. you know, have him on that wheel route where they're going to make the defense deal with him and it's going to open things up for the receivers. I, I think what they did with Boardingham on Saturday made life easier for Pearsall. Because think about it, Pearsall has been the only legitimate target almost the entire time he's been in Gainesville. Mm -hmm. But on Saturday, South Carolina couldn't just worry about Pearsall and look at how many times he was in one-on-one -on -one coverage or just open. Like mm -hmm. that was, that was progress, I think. So I, I thought the way they handled that game was, was very encouraging. And I do realize that if that ball had bounced differently, because I, 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 I've got, I've got a mailbag show tonight. And so I've got South Carolina fans emailing me like, what are we going to do? This is awful. How do we, what, what do we do? We're done. And right. That's what Florida fans would be doing had that ball bounced a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, that that's probably the biggest thing that we've seen throughout the season is the immersion of some additional targets. And we'll see how that continues to play out. Uh, obviously, Ricky Pearsall was your one. And then there was a, a big question mark about what that would look like after, uh, you know, Marcus Burke, Jaquavion Frazier is kind of your list of, of wide receivers that have been there for a little while. You add Eugene Wilson, Hayden Hansen played well uh, in that game, and he's great at blocking. Arliss Boardingham obviously had a good game. So as the season progresses, you start to see some additional targets that now deep defenses have to figure out how they're going to cover, which leaves obvious situations where the Rick Pierce is going to be one-on-one -on -one or Eugene Wilson's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. So I am curious there. Obviously defense is probably the biggest question that, that a lot of Gator fans are still wondering about. Obviously played really well, uh, probably the first four games of the season. Um, the last few weeks haven't looked all that great. You know, Sands, Vanderbilt, the Kentucky, South Carolina game, uh, obviously well, Florida. Here, here, you know, here's the thing, Dan, did, did they play really well? at the beginning of the season or were they playing Utah's JV offense and Tennessee without two starting offensive line? Right, We've been that, banged up too, Andy. 
<laughs> I know, but think of, think about that. It, it, it might make more sense to understand why it's not like they just fell apart defensively. Mm-hmm. They faced better competition defensively. So that, that's the thing that, <clears throat> and, and they're young. I still think they can get better. The, the thing about all of it with Florida is it does feel like the best players are the youngest players, which is mm-hmm. what did we talk about at the beginning of the season? If you get to the end of the year and the best players are the youngest players, you should feel pretty good about things. I, I and that's think- kind of what I've told fans in defense of Napier. I'm like, listen, you're going to have to take lumps. And, and even if you know that going into the season, like, hey, we're young, we're going to have to take lumps. It doesn't make the lumps in real time feel any better. So I get like the anger, but if you look at the best players on the team, the guys that are making an impact, they were either brought in in the transfer portal or in the last two recruiting classes. So you've got a handful of older guys from the portal and you're relying on freshmen, redshirt freshmen. So, I I mean, the back end of this schedule is tough, but like those freshmen, do we even call them freshmen anymore? Like they played five, six, seven games. I'm excited to see how they play against this this part of the schedule because – this is what the schedule is going to look like next year. Mm -hmm. I mean, the schedule is very hard next year, but it shouldn't matter. Like if you're a good SEC team, it doesn't matter if you have a hard schedule. So how do these guys handle playing against the Georgias and the LSUs of the Mm -hmm. world or this Florida state team, which is very, very good. Like how do they handle that? Do they, do they shrink from it? Do they rise to the level of competition? If you see them rising to the level of competition and even if they lose, but if they make these games competitive, I think you should be pretty pumped mm-hmm. going forward. Now, if if they just get blown out, if they look like they don't belong on the field, that's a different story. But I don't know that that's going to happen. I, I don't. I you know, the Kentucky game w- was was discouraging for sure. But if these guys, especially as they keep like the two tight ends I just mentioned, they're both second year guys. They're both guys that Billy Napier brought in, like. If they keep expanding their role in the offense as the season goes on, that is a good sign for the future. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I I keep telling people like you can't bail on Napier because they're not going to, because they're not paying his buyout. So mm-hmm. you are going to be dealing with Billy Napier next year. So accept that. But you could also look at that the fact that the players he's brought in seem to be pretty good. Mm-hmm. So what do you think a... about? Oh, sorry, sorry. Sal, go ahead. I mean to cut you off. You can finish your uh, take. Oh no, no, I'm good. <laughs> what do you? What do you? Uh, I think offense had a solid game. There's a lot of offensive line stuff we need to get cleaned up, but I do see some progression in the offense. Uh, you know, I'm getting better defensive. Defensively, I'm concerned about our front four uh, getting you know sacks, turnovers, getting to the passer, especially when we come down to stretch with better teams. And what's your feel on Austin Armstrong? Well, he's probably got to have a little older and better group to work with. That would help. I mean, think think about who who your best players are. You know, Shamar James, Scooby Williams. Like these are young guys. So, mm-hmm. I, I think it's hard in the SEC when your your best players are freshmen and sophomores on defense, and and they don't have any aliens in terms of the pass rush. They just don't have that. And Correct. they're in a league where almost everybody has somebody like that. Like if you watched mm-hmm. Alabama, Arkansas over the weekend, like Landon Jackson is a freak. He's six, seven, two eighty. Like Arkansas has lost five in a row, but they've got that guy. Mm-hmm. And he's just demolishing Alabama's left tackle play after play, after play, after play. Florida didn't have anything like that. That's what Florida has to get slash develop. Yeah. I think we have that in maybe the young boys like TJ Searcy and Kelby. Right. I think we've seen sparks of that from them and, and look for look forward to that in the future. Yeah, yeah and with I you think, on that. I think Kelby, like a prime example, you go out to spring practice this past year and you see him and you're like, Ooh, that looks different. Okay. That feels like it's a little bit different. But mm-hmm. obviously at that position, you're not going to see a lot of guys just come in as true right. freshmen and blow mm-hmm. up. Like they, that's a, Dominate, that's a yeah. second year, third year kind of thing. Cause you're dealing with grown ass men on the other side of the line of scrimmage usually. So I think, I think they're on the right track there, but it's, but I don't think there's any, there's no rescue coming this year. Like mm-hmm. there's not. Been, now that you say that being young in a COVID era, like of like these super, super seniors mm-hmm. and we're super, yep. super young, like that puts yep. you in a, in a terrible space. Exactly. Now it's not, not as much against like a Georgia, 
the mm -hmm. problem with Georgia being that they're all NFL players anyway. But <laughs> it's against it's against your Missouris of the world and your Arkansas's of the world, where they probably got a twenty three year old dude playing on the other side, mm -hmm. and that's a problem. Like, it, it just the difference between an 18, 19 year old and 23 year old is significant, especially among large people. So that's, you're exactly right. So, and, and it's funny because that's going to filter itself out. Correct. Next year by 25, it's pretty much gone. So you don't have that much. You'll have more fifth year seniors that hang around because of, of NIL mm -hmm. where they would have been, you know, sixth or seventh round draft pick. They're going to, they're going to stay in school one more year and be a good player. And, and live on that. But I do think that part of it where the teams that are typically not sending guys to the NFL as third and fourth year players, they're so old right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's the bigger reason for the, the level of parity you're seeing across the board. Uh, Cause you know, we, we talk about NIL and transfer portal and I definitely think that has something to do with it too. But I think that COVID year is, is probably the biggest factor there. Yeah, and obviously Florida goes through a coaching change there, a, a big coaching difference too, right? The, the type of coach, the type of offense, everything else. So Florida did lose a lot of those guys uh, during that time. Andy, uh, Gators have Georgia, uh, LSU, Missouri, uh, Arkansas, and FSU left. How do you see that working out for the Gators? You see, I know you said probably one, maybe two. Uh, is there a way that Florida can be competitive against you know, Florida State, who I know is ranked high, obviously has a good game against Syracuse last week, has looked pretty up and down. Obviously, a team chock full of those COVID yep. year, fourth, fifth, sixth year guys that are there. Uh, but but where do you see Florida kind of growing from from this you know, through the rest of the season? See, I, I have a hard time envisioning them being competitive against Georgia because mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to get sleepy Georgia. If they right. got sleepy Georgia, then that's probably an interesting game, at least for a little while. But the problem is Georgia was just sleepy against Vanderbilt. I need no Brock Georgia. That's what yeah. I need. The no Brock. Well, you, you, I think you're getting no Brock Georgia. But that's what Georgia's I need. been like sleepy all year. But then they got a bunch of talk about Kentucky. And Kentucky was going to be a mm -hmm. tough game. And then like the real Georgia shows up. And yeah, you're not going to get a sleepy the last, Georgia in The last thing you need is, is Florida people being super excited because of the South Carolina one. I'm like, oh, now, now we can beat Georgia. All that does is piss them off. <laughs> so... But yeah, if they if they come out and, and and I do think with the week off, even if they don't have Brock Bowers, they're gonna have a week to figure out what to do without him. And they still have a bunch of really good players. So I think Georgia's gonna be a tough one. They should be able to beat Arkansas. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be easy. I think that one might wind up in another shootout. I remember Arkansas and LSU played a shootout. Like huh? you you may see that again. And because because you can again you can score on Arkansas's defense you can beat them deep as Alabama showed you last week as LSU showed you as mm -hmm. so th there are ways to do this and it's it's strange to say that because uh, you'd look at this at the beginning of the season and say well this is going to be a rock fight I don't know that that's the way to beat them but I think Florida can beat them like that's that's your bowl eligibility game right there mm -hmm. and then you're wearing black jerseys. So you have to win. Yeah, for the veterans. For that's that's true. Yeah. yeah, I I notice any any controversial jersey choice you have to make it for the troops, and then then it's no controversial it, anymore. It, it they should have made the criticized. they should have made the green reptile ones for the troops, and they would have been an all time favorite for the Gators. Oh, well, if they hadn't lost slapping the name, maybe they, the troops. I was to say if they hadn't lost to Texas A and M, maybe maybe they would have come back. But yeah. the Missouri game, they're playing really well. Mm -hmm. But where that game falls, I, I there, there's a there's definitely a chance. Now, uh, does Florida winning against South Carolina or at South Carolina mean that Florida's road road woes are done? I, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I do think there, there's there's a shot there against Missouri. Although Columbia, Missouri has been a house of horrors for the Gators. I said I said before the season, like I thought Missouri was going to be bad though, so I thought. No, Two they're, bad they're teams, good. November 18th, probably at noon, 11 a.m. local, cold, yeah. not a lot of people there. And I'm like, I've, I've seen Florida lose that exact game so many times. Uh, but Missouri's good. Yeah, Missouri may be trying to get itself into a, a New Year's Six Bowl at that point. 
Now they, they'd have to beat they'd have to have beaten Tennessee the week before to do that because I think they're probably losing at Georgia. But mm-hmm. they get Tennessee at home the week before. Now Florida is is catching them at the end of a pretty tough stretch where they're mm-hmm. playing Georgia and Tennessee right in a row. So I think that helps that helps Florida on that front. But Florida, of course, will be coming off the LSU game and against LSU. Listen, just I. I Billy Napier is going to probably have to be as uncomfortable as possible with his game plan, but he showed last week he can pull it off. Like, just chuck it. Just just try to make it, try to hang in a 55 to, to 52 game because I don't know that anybody's stopping LSU's offense except maybe Alabama, but I think mm-hmm. Alabama is going to have some trouble with them, and that game may end up higher scoring. Now, I think – the problem for LSU is, is there a bad style matchup for Alabama? Like Jalen Milrow doesn't do much great throwing the ball except throw the deep ball. Well, guess, guess what LSU is terrible at covering. So like, I, I think LSU is going to be in that situation coming off the Alabama game where especially if they lose, they're going to be pissed off and they're going to, they're going to want to try to, to make a point. So mm-hmm. like the only way to do that may be, like, hey, <laughs> we're going to try to air it out, play your game, because I don't see anybody limiting LSU scoring. Like, you could try to limit possessions or limit the time they have the ball, but they're going to score in like a minute and a half. Mm-hmm. Like, unless Florida's defense just magically changes from what we saw over the weekend. Like, that that's going to be that's gonna be a tough one to win. But, no, I, I do think it's – and then the Florida State game, it's at home. Florida State could be under some significant pressure mm-hmm. if they're still undefeated. They want to be undefeated going to the ACC championship game. We don't know what the rest of the country will look like at that point. If they're undefeated going to the ACC championship game because they have the LSU win, especially if, like, let's say LSU beats Alabama and mm-hmm. LSU may, might win the West. Like, Florida State would be in a great position where they could even maybe lose the ACC championship game and still make the playoffs. So they'll need to win that one against Florida. But that's a that's a game rivalry situation. A bunch of young Florida players wanting to prove a point. Country's mm-hmm. probably watching. That's a, it's a good spot. It reminds me a little bit of the 97 Florida FSU situation. And so I think I think that one could be fun. But that one, another one where where Florida will have to play maybe an uncomfortable style for Napier because, and maybe that's what this team is. You mm-hmm. know, I, I keep saying it, but we saw it you work. You keep saying it. It hasn't even like sunk into me yet. Like, what are we talking about? Florida is going to be like a, an air raid offense. Now. No, but here, here's the thing. Nah, that's a, that's it an might exaggeration. fail miserably. It might like, this could also lose you a game 42 to 13. If, if the other team's defense is, is having a good day, but it may give you your only chance to win. And that that's the question. Do you, do you risk the embarrassment of losing that way? Whereas you could lose a little closer playing the style that, that Billy likes to play, but that style probably isn't going to win you the game. Like that. Probably, I don't think Billy likes to zero. I mean, cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I don't think that's Billy's style anymore. I think that's Louis Louisiana's style of football. But since he's been at the University of Florida, the offense, like AR threw the ball 40 some times some games, right? Uh, you come back this year, we thought the offense is going to be run, play defense, possess the ball. Um, while we've seen that versus Tennessee, the rest of these games, we're seeing the run get abandoned quick and us pitch the ball around more than we expected to. I, I still don't know what Billy offense is going to be at Florida, but it's it's nowhere near what it was at Louisiana when you look at the run pass ratio. No, and and because that was what worked at Louisiana, and and that's again that's a good sign. It's a good sign that you see him adapt based on what he's got and based on the circumstances of the games. the The problem, the the, the tricky part here is to win against LSU or Missouri or Florida State you're probably going to have to risk playing a style that could get you beat 42 to 13. And it's okay because you give yourself a chance to win that way. And, and I, I, I think, I think Napier and his staff understand you got to give yourself a chance. Like losing close doesn't, 
does it matter? Does it feel better? Like, go try to win. And there will there will, there will need to be some risks taken because they will not be the more talented team against LSU. They might not be the more talented team against Missouri. And hmm. the, and Missouri's the thing is Luther Burden is is one of the best receivers in the country. Brady Cook's been fantastic this year. Mm-hmm. And Missouri's just they're, whatever they're doing, they're figuring out ways. To, they should have beaten LSU. Like they should not have lost that game, but they figured out a way to win against Kansas State. They were losing against Kentucky. They're down 14 nothing. They call that that fake punt. The punter throws a touchdown pass, and all of a sudden they're like, "All right, we got this." And punter threw a dime. Oh, mm-hmm. that, was that was a beautiful throw. But yeah, it's it's interesting because that team just seems to understand. Hey, we hang in there. We can win this thing. So, I, I, you know, I I'm actually kind of excited to see what Florida does against this this stretch because it is very hard. Mm. But the players we thought would be coming up as freshmen and, and, and would have to play important roles are starting to play important roles. And you and got probably better than anticipated, too, I would mm-hmm. imagine. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that there's some, there's some surprises. I, I hope you're not looking at the comment section because they're they're cooking at task <laughs> right now. You you've deflated all of their balloons. You are one singular rain cloud over their parade right now. Um, what? But I, but I think you, that, what? you beat South Carolina on a one bounce catch. Like, I don't know. If South Carolina's a terrible team though. Like if you look at the schedule, they they play they play the toughest schedule in college football. That the gauntlet they started with was North Carolina. Uh, who they had North Carolina, Tennessee, and who else? Um, I can't remember, Georgia. but I think they get Georgia. Georgia. Yeah, so Georgia. they they've had the toughest schedule to start the yeah, season. They beat, they beat Mississippi um, we, State, so we'll we'll see we'll see when we they caught get them off of a bye. Uh, they had a little bit more time to prepare for us homecoming. It was their Super Bowl. Um, and, and I'm not I'm not gonna Super say they're a terrible team. I think it was Georgia definitely was, their Super Bowl. I think Georgia was their Super Bowl. Well, they lost. They were up Super 14, Bowl, So this was Super Bowl time time try number two. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't, uh, they didn't think it was going to be Georgia in real life. They they knew they had a shot at in Florida. real in real life. I, I will yeah. say, Andy, the South Carolina team that has two wins looked a hell of a lot different than the South Carolina team that played on Saturday, right? Spencer Rattler, Leggett. Oh, they Spencer Rattler is very good. Off. Like that. Yeah. That's the thing. Like that North Carolina game. I talked to Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl, and Rattler got sacked like nine times in that game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If Rattler hadn't been as good as he is, he would have been sacked like nineteen times. So, yeah, Spencer Rattler's good, man. Yeah, he is. I, mean, he I never is thought fantastic. that I would say that when I watched his like QB show that was on. I don't know, it was like twenty thirteen when he was a senior in high school. But um, his QB he, show was the year before, filmed the year before Anthony Richardson's because ARs didn't come out. But he's older than Anthony Richardson. Just. Hanging around, I think he has another year of eligibility potentially. I hope. I think I, oh no, Rattler, Rattler's done. He's played five. Oh. Yeah, you get like seven in the COVID years, I think, though. Yeah, well, I actually, think so. no, I take that back. He did redshirt uh, 2019, so yes, he could come back. Wow, <laughs> you're right for for his age 24 or 25 season. He's gonna be getting his second PhD by that point in time. I, I so did, I did no click on the comments, by the way, guys. And and yeah, they're that, they think it's a debate, bro. Like, we're not here to debate Andy, man. It's, <laughs> it's not, it's we're not. Here to talk this interview football. went just as planned, Chris. I know you said this interview didn't go as planned. Chris. That's Chris why we bring a... on people, right? Because well, oftentimes yeah. we live in our world, right? We're super excited. Sometimes we need to bring differing thoughts, differing well, opinions. And, and the, the some thing people is... to rain on parades. That's okay. The thing is, everybody gets all excited based on a win or a loss, which, yes, that the wins and losses obviously matter the most. But what is – there's a super thin line sometimes between your coach is a moron and your coach is a genius. Mm-hmm. And right right now, Shane Beamer is on the wrong side of the line and Billy Napier is on the right side of the line. Things and we've seen that before. We've seen it with Jim McElwain and Butch Jones. Like, we, we, we've seen that. And you just have to understand that – if you're a team that is winning that way, you also can lose that way. Mm-hmm. Now, if you stack a bunch of wins that way, that's great. Florida has not stacked a bunch of wins that way. You know, they, they've, they've stacked beaten, five. Yeah. Yeah. All right. They've beaten three teams they absolutely should have beaten and, and would have been completely embarrassed had they lost. Tennessee is a great, great win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nick said South they were a bad team, only one loss on the season. 
No, Tennessee. Tennessee's bad? a very good way. Yeah, you did. You said that was a bad Tennessee game. We can rewind the audio. The comment section <laughs> had it, Nick. I think I definitely called Milton bad, but I don't know if I called the whole team bad. Maybe, possibly. Firing off the mouth. I, I just, I, I think it's funny because I, I saw somebody saying Andy was probably one of the Mertz doubters. Guys, he had one great game. He's been good all season. I don't, think, I don't know about so like I, great, but he's been he's been he was, better than was, expected. He was great on Saturday. Like there, that there was, was a great game. I don't. There was a I lot of think people that was, had grammar. I don't think that was his cleanest game on the fast. season. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> I don't think that was his cleanest game, despite the stats. I don't think that was his cleanest game. I think they they had to put it in his hands to win it. Yes, and they said go win this game, and he did. And I which is a huge awesome. question we had. Yeah. Like that fourth and ten throw <laughs> was nails. Like that, he was as calm as could be, and you you looked at him moving around the pocket, and he just he looked very comfortable, and so that was what you hoped he would be. That's mm-hmm. what Wisconsin hoped he would be when they when they signed him. So I thought that was great. The thing is, is it repeatable? And we're gonna find out. We I don't find that. Yeah, and, and again, I thing. don't. I'm not saying he needs to do that against Georgia. Like I'm not. <laughs> but can you do that against Arkansas, against Missouri, mm-hmm. against that LSU secondary? Yeah, you can. Like that, he can do that. And so I don't. And and that's the part with him I'm curious about because we know how conservative the Paul Christ offense was at Wisconsin. Like if you kind of let him cook, is this what you're going to get? Because mm. that could be kind of fun. When we were talking to him after the game, uh, like career number, he just like smiled. He was like, I'm having a blast. This is the <laughs> most fun I've ever had. I'm like, probably because you're not handing the ball off 38 times a game. Well, yeah. And also his teammates really like him. Like mm-hmm. he he definitely seems to have everybody's respect. And it, it was fun to watch. And it's always fun. Like Rattler's another good example of that. Both those guys got just kind of destroyed at their old places. And then have gotten to have this kind of vindication, redemption arc. Rattler when he beat Tennessee and Clemson last year, and Mertz now. So I, I do. I, I'd love to see what happens if they keep playing like that and keep kind of giving him the keys and let him. But the thing is, if you do that, that there is there's risk involved. Like when you're playing a better defense, you might some of those some of those passes might get intercepted. But mm-hmm. it's sure a fun way to go. Like. I think it's a more fun way to to do it. And and like I said, it may be the way, the only way to make some of these games winnable down Mm -hmm. the stretch. So I I, I, like, I'm not going to crush them if they take some chances that allows them to have a winnable game and it doesn't go right. And they look and and they they get beat by a better team. I feel so comfortable. My bad. I mean, Coach Huff, you think you're going to stop sometimes. I'm sorry. Uh, it's all right. You keep going. Silk, you talk when you want to talk. This is your show. <laughs> no, nah, bro. I, I, I don't like to, like, cut people off. That's a bad habit. Um, But sometimes you guys pause. I think you're about to stop. I do. I'm encouraged about how well I'm so comfortable when he when he's, you know, under him. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I didn't expect to not have, like, both his interceptions are two interceptions that he probably shouldn't even have. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's taking care of the ball very well. Uh, he's in, in good leadership skills. Um, there is some things that we could clean up, more shots we can take, and he did that this game. And I don't think that was by accident. I think there, there's some, you know, of course, noise in the system with Steve Spurrier saying that we need to take more shots. I do think Billy pulled him to the side to or to work on his development with taking those deeper shots because we had – I said it earlier in the show, we had guys open that, that would have just moved the sticks. But it was a concentrated effort this game. We're going to have to do that going for- forward. But I feel comfortable with him. It's going to have to be the guys around Merce that step up. I think Merce is going to be fine. Uh, all, sh- shoring up the offensive line and the protection so he's not getting hit every time he dropped back. Um, that's going to be key. Uh, playmakers just staying healthy. Trey Wilson staying healthy. He makes the mm-hmm. offense go. Those guys growing up around him. But it's just a week-to-week lead. There's no dominant team in college football right now. Um, I've seen teams like Boston College play Florida State close and should they should have won that game, right? Uh, I've seen Georgia struggle with some teams early on. That just gives me a little optimism that we could go play any team and not worry about getting blown out. I don't think we'll have to get in an actual shootout with I mean, I mean, LSU and Mizzou, maybe the shootouts you get into. But I'm not scared of a shootout even with Florida State. I think 
Their offensive line is going to struggle. Their defense is got a lot of holes in it. Um, their secondary has a lot of holes in it. Georgia is the only one that could probably possibly blow us out, but I don't even think that's going to happen. I think Georgia is going to face a tough football game next week. And as long as we keep it in, you know, uh, 10 points into the fourth quarter, we're going to be all right. Um, I, I'm not predicting us to win, about, but I, I think we can make it better. But it, it, it's interesting, though. I'm thinking about the taking shots thing. They did take more shots against South Carolina, but they also did what they've been doing, but had more success with some of those – some of those underneath routes, you had guys slipping tackles and turning turning them into more. Correct. Like I was I was watching, rewatching the highlights just before I came on, and there's a play like there's a there's a play where he kind of dumps it down to Boardingham, and Boardingham slips a tackle, it turns it into a first down. Like mm -hmm. stuff like that matters too, and that's one of those things that you you kind of wonder: is that development? Are they getting better at that? Is that South Carolina's defense? We won't know until we see them play these next few games, but that would be, that would be a huge thing too. And I also wonder, is that Wilson being an option there too? Cause he's, yeah. he's one of those guys when he catches the ball, it's not going to be just where he caught it. Usually it's going right. to be him going, you know, a little bit further. And I think that helps them a lot too, because, you know, they were trying to force feed him early. He gets hurt against Tennessee comes back kind of a little bit slowly, but now it seems like he's he's healthy and and mm -hmm. doing what he's supposed to be doing. So I, that's what I again. I know these guys think I'm pooping on the parade. I'm actually Ooh, optimistic about this. Like there is exactly what we said when I was with you, was with you guys in the preseason. Mm -hmm. Will their best players be their young players? The answer is yes. Like that's the part to be excited about. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, Trey Wilson is just crazy different. That that play, mm -hmm. he gets the reverse or whatever, and in, in, in Missouri, they rush in, blitz right off the edge of where we run in that reverse, and he makes both of those guys miss and go for like you know, like 15 yards. Yeah. That just shows just how different he is. Just get him the ball, keep him healthy. Uh, ET and getting healthy is going to be key too. Go yeah, and, and and that's what some of these some of these really good offenses. Like Ohio State isn't just throwing over the top of people all the time. Correct. Like they'll throw they'll throw a, an underneath route to Abuka or to Julian Fleming, and that guy will take it, you know, forty yards. You have to be Martin able. To Harrison's do that a too. pretty good option too. He's okay. He's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean that that's what some of these better offenses do routinely, and that's what Florida has not been able to do really until we saw him do it on Saturday. And if they can, if that's going to be a consistent part of their offense going forward, then you got something going now, against Georgia. Like I said, that's a harder thing to do. Like Georgia mm -hmm. last year was great at keeping everything in front of them. Like they mm -hmm. did not give up a lot of yak yards and they're still probably in that mold this year. They're not as talented defensively as they were last year, but they're still really good. But these other teams, I've seen LSU and Missouri and Arkansas give up a ton of yak yards. Like they're all that they're out there for you. Yeah, obviously it's been a, an interesting season for the Gators. Uh, five and two, I think, is about as good of a record as anybody thought the Gators would have at this point. Whether those losses were against Kentucky or Tennessee or Utah, whatever it might be, it's been a it's been a unique up and ride for the Gators this season. But you know, hopefully, you're starting to see some improvement. You go into a bye week. Then you have Georgia hopefully get healthy. You know, Eugene Wilson, ETN probably still nursing some things. Offensive line has had some injuries. A lot of teams are dealing with injuries, right? I know this isn't a uniquely Florida problem, but hopefully the bye comes at a good time for the Gators to be able to get a little bit better. And hopefully they're showing some improvement, right? You come back, you beat Vanderbilt the way you're supposed to. You go win on the road. Even if South Carolina isn't a good team or a great team, whatever it might be, you go, you get that monkey off your back. You do some things a little bit differently. Hopefully you're seeing some growth and improvement there. Don't know if any of us ever anticipate the Gators going, winning 9, 10, 11 games a season, but hopefully it's those those small steps forward that you know put you now in a position to compete against LSU, Arkansas, et cetera. The aggregate of marginal gains, as Kirby Smart often says. Uh, but look. It's a big word for Kirby. What 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 do we say? <laughs> what do we, we said? I think I said seven wins at the beginning of the season. I think you mm -hmm. guys were all kind of in a six, seven, eight in a similar yeah. vein. Like, I think that's fine. 
given mm-hmm. what they they were dealing with going into the season, given the schedule, I think that would be fine. And like I said, if the young guys are better at season at season's mm-hmm. end and they look like they will be the ones carrying the team next year. Mm. That's yeah, fine. I think that's what I think that's a big thing that we had kind of all agreed. I'm sure Andy had the same take. Is like it's not just how many wins you have; it's like what those wins look like and who's making the plays to win those. Right? Like you'll probably get Graham Mertz back next year, mm-hmm. and almost all of your playmakers, except for Ricky Pearsall, on offense and defense for the most part are yeah. freshmen, true freshmen, redshirt freshmen, sophomore. Right? Like obviously the transfer portal NIL maybe changes some of that. Like if there's an opportunity to leave, but like you're probably going to get a a or, very large percentage of returning Dan, you're, mm-hmm. and Dan, you're looking at it that, you know, as, as they would be someone to be poached from, but I don't necessarily think that, that people may look at this roster and go, Oh, if I can fill in this hole in this roster, this could be a pretty right. good team. Yeah. Why mm-hmm. go to Alabama when I can go to Florida, right? So somebody, somebody in the transfer portal, who's really good may look at that and say, well, they are a me away from being significantly better. Right. And that's, I mean, that's how you recruit it. If you're Billy Napier. Yeah, yeah, I think you also. I think you also approach the uh, with, with, with a with a guy like Graham Mertz. Um, you already seen his potential in offense and what his team could be. You approach this offense in the transfer portal because it is business. It is nil. It is yep. pretty much like contracts and deals you're putting out. Yeah, exactly. So I think your pocket's a little bit different this offseason than it was last year with a rebuild in mind. This year you go in with, you know, we got some weapons. We just got to fill in a few spots with some playmakers, offensive linemen, and we could probably roll a little bit here. So I think the approach with the uh, transfer portal is going to be a little bit different this offseason as well. And the, the Mertz piece of it's interesting too. I, you know, I, I don't want to compare him to, to Dylan Gabriel, but the circumstances are, feel a little bit similar where Dylan Gabriel was somewhat limited last year because there's nothing behind him. Mm-hmm. And you saw when he got hurt. Like when Oklahoma played Texas last year with a backup quarterback, it was horrific. They have Jackson Arnold now. And Jackson Arnold was was that guy in the quarterback class that every, all the coaches were like, that's my favorite guy. And they're much more confident doing things with Dylan Gabriel because if they lose him to injury, they, they're confident Jackson Arnold can come in and play and they'd still be pretty good. Right. Next year may feel that way for Florida. DJ Lagway is that guy that you talk to the coaches. They're like, that's the guy I really like in this class. You know, Perhaps you bring him along, you you know, you have Mertz, you, you're not throwing DJ in as a true freshman and saying, save us. And that allows you to be a little more confident with Mertz and just say, hey, do what you got to do. Let's 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 run it wide open because mm-hmm. we're not worried about losing you because we have this guy and we think he can be pretty good. So I think that that circumstance could help them a lot next year. Now, that'll be again, the first year that we could do that too, because we couldn't do that last year with AR. Yeah. Like we had, we was on the same circumstances. Like we got to watch how this guy, you know, plays get injured because if he goes out, we're in trouble. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the, when's the last time Florida had a situation where they felt good about the backup quarterback. I guess AR I with AR when when AR was was there with Emory or when when AR was there with mm. with Trask. I felt great about Trask, Trask with yeah. Trask Felipe. Yeah. Although they didn't feel good enough, we lied good. Asking. They should have been starting him. So we lied good because I felt good about Emory behind Trask, but in reality, like <laughs> literally, we know. <laughs> right, Trask behind Felipe was the best situation. You know, the best backup situation, but it should have been it should have been reversed been the other way around. Correct. Yeah. yeah. It's, unfortunately, it took a, a bad injury to to see that. Maybe one Cam other thing, and Tim Tebow. I <laughs> that, love. That was pretty good. I love. Um, the kind of leader that Graham is, I think if he's back next year, which I, I think he will be, unless he slings it around in all these shootouts you're talking about and, and you know <laughs> goes nuts. Um, I think it's unbelievably great for DJ Lagway to come in and learn from him and just see how he goes about his business and what he does. And, and DJ is not going to be thrown in if Graham is back, but you can sit there and watch how a 23 will be 24 next December man goes about his business and, and learn and, and see how the team reacts to him. So I think that's mm-hmm. something we probably haven't well, even talked about. And also about just, Mertz seems like the kind of guy who would be very generous would embrace in terms that. of yeah. yeah, being a mentor and all that. So mm-hmm. I, I think, I think it's, you know, it's trending up. We, if we, if we talk the Monday after the Georgia game, I think people will probably be pretty down again because <laughs> 
George is really good. But I think if we just look at this in terms of trajectory, you should feel all right. Like this is exactly what you said needed to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot going on with this team. We have a, a week off to get healthy, uh, to watch some other games. Um, and then we'll be back in, in Jack, beautiful city of Jacksonville, their number one tourist event of the entire year. Uh, probably keeps their entire tourism budget going. So, Andy, <laughs> let's um, let's let, uh, let's let you run. I know Nick has to go to Billy Napier here soon as well. No, uh, no Andy, Billy let this every, week. Say what? No Billy this week. We're no Billy here. this week. Billy's All right. Well, here. Andy, if you want to stick around for another two, three hours, um, <laughs> who who do you have winning the Heisman Trophy? Michael Penix. Ooh. I got Penix right now, but man, yeah. Jaden Daniels is coming on. Like Jaden yeah. Daniels is is very. Tough to die, and also Caleb Williams had one bad game. Like, yeah, if I, if I'm picking right now, like who if I was drafting a college quarterback, and I had all these guys, I'd still probably take Caleb Williams. Yeah, but I I do think Penix. I mean, God, he was so good against Oregon, and just it, I mean that that situation where they get the ball back after they stop him on fourth down, and it's like, okay, go do something. Mm -hmm. And it takes him like two plays <laughs> and he's, they're back in the end zone. So, uh, but, but Jaden Daniels has become, like, it's, it's crazy how good he's been this season. And he had, he's had to be because their defense has been so bad. Now the finally against Auburn, they, they got some stops, but man, that dude, uh, cause it felt like for at first LSU's entire run game was Jaden Daniels scrambling. Now they have a you know a little bit of a run game, and then he also can scramble when something breaks down in the pass game. And those two receivers are are you know the the two best receivers are really really good uh, neighbors and and uh, why am I blanking on <laughs> Brian Thomas? Uh, those those guys are great, but so I, he may put up just such absurd numbers that we can't not give it to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting to uh, to see. It's an interesting year of college football, probably the one with a lot of storylines that uh, make it intriguing, uh, a lot of parody, a lot of new teams on there. And I will say this, if FSU gets into the playoff as a one-loss team and Air Force is still undefeated and they don't make it over them, I just think the NCAA hates America and the college football playoff <laughs> hates America. Um, I, for one, will be on the picket line to put Air Force in over Florida State. Uh, but Andy, we'll let you run. Let everybody know. I need one more for Andy, real quick. One. one more Go for ahead. Andy. Andy, mm -hmm. give me give me two or three guys you would like to see at OC if we were to make that that that. Oh God, this is I've been hard. thinking about this because I don't know again how flexible stylistically would would Billy be willing to be. I'd say one guy I've liked this year is, is Kirby Moore at Missouri. And interestingly, he he got into a situation where you had a, a long time a head coach who was giving up play calling after calling plays for a long time. And they've been great. I mean, that that's been a great arrangement. Eli Drinkwitz before the season was like, I just realized I was not doing as good a job as a CEO as I could be doing, and I wasn't as good of an OC as I could have been. So I wanted to change it and they bring in Kirby Moore and he's been, he's been outstanding. Uh, Ryan Grubb from Washington's fantastic. I don't think they can get him away from there because Alabama tried last year and it, and it didn't work. Um, Andy Ludwig at Utah has been very, very good, especially in the circumstances that they've been dealing with this year. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know they're getting Cam Rising back like that. When you find out when, when he talks about the, totality of that knee injury he suffered in a Rose Bowl. They keep saying it's, oh, it's, you know, it's maybe the week to week. It sounds like maybe not. So Ludwig has been kind of stringing that thing together with, uh, with coat hangers, but he was, you know, before the season really good when he had rising that stylistically may be pretty close to what Billy's looking for. And, you know, he Ludwig interviewed at Notre Dame last year. And then they had a weird situation where there was some sort of miscommunication about what his buyout was from Utah and Notre Dame's like, ah, we're not going to pay the buyout. And I was like, what? Like you had him at the basketball game with Marcus Freeman. <laughs> You're Notre Dame. You got the money. Just yeah. pay the buyout. But they're, they're happy with Jared Parker now. So, or well, this week they are, but 
yeah, it, it so th those would be some names I'd think about. Like Ludwig would probably stylistically make a lot of sense. Um, uh, I don't know that that Kirby Moore would make a lot of sense stylistically. Uh, but again, I don't know if if they do decide to go with an OC, how willing to kind of say this is your show and I'm I'm open to a lot of things. Like, mm -hmm. is that Billy Napier or is it gonna be, hey, I like what I like. And so I'm going to hire somebody who, who's a similar mindset to me. Jeff Scott. But Jeff's never really called plays. Like Tony Elliott called the plays when Jeff and, and Tony were the, the co-OCs. He didn't call plays at USF either? Uh, he had Charlie Weiss Jr. And then he lost him. And then uh, he had Trickett calling plays. Mm. So, yeah, that's... So Jeff Scott's going to get you a bunch of good receivers. <laughs> like that's that's his speciality, but I I don't know that you know if if you're going to do that, you'd probably go in with someone who's more experienced Proven. than play caller. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you. Hmm. Hmm. Something I'm glad it's not up. if it's not Jeff Scott, I'm happy, you know. I just wanted I wanted you to knock that down. I love I up. love Jeff. Jeff's a great guy. I you know, I Not for my OC, I don't <laughs> well, I mean that—that's the thing that that name popping up is an interesting one, and it makes sense. Relationships they go way yeah. back, yeah. Right. So they understand each other very well, but yeah, that, that the question is how much did because now he did re remember the play where Hunter Renfro scored to win the national title. Mm -hmm. Jeff Jeff suggested that one. That's higher. Let's Jeff go. called yeah. that one. Yeah. <laughs> I do yeah. know that for a fact. So so it's back in. There you so go. All happy. right, he's back on the list. No, Send the contract. You sold but, but me, that's, man. That's, that's that's the question for me. Is is just if, if Billy says I'm gonna I'm gonna hire an OC, how willing is he to be schematically flexible, or does he want to run what he wants to run? And I think that that will that will give us the answer to what the list is. Yeah, right. a lot of changes have to happen. I would imagine that we'll see a few. Probably even on special teams. Who knows? Maybe Shane Beamer can be a special teams analyst for us. <laughs> um, Andy, let everybody know where they can follow you. Uh, read all your work. And uh, we appreciate you coming on again, my friend. Yeah, I'm an on three. Same place as Nick Del Torre. Uh, you, can, you can go to the on three sports YouTube page and see my show every night. It premieres at 8 p.m. Eastern time, Thursday through Sunday. It's also on demand anytime you want it. It's on every podcast platform. And you, I'm a Andy underscore Staples on X and uh, also Andy underscore Staples on Instagram. So uh, you, you, know, you know where to find me. You know where to find you. Great college sports takes, but also even better food takes. Go follow mm. Andy. Andy, we appreciate you coming on the show today, my friend. And we will talk with you soon. Uh, and thanks for not reading every comment. Um, but I'm sure everybody <laughs> appreciated your time. It was today. cooking you, Andy. Have a good one, my guy. <laughs> they, they, do, they do it everywhere. Every every yeah, fan yeah. base is, is part yeah. of the job. So yeah, you hate every fan base. I love it. All right, I, Andy. Your school, even even my school. So. Yeah, even your school. <laughs> awesome, Andy. Thank you so much. Appreciate for you, Andy. All right, see you.